This is the second video about the Germanic tribes. Please watch the first video, Germanic tribes and Roman Germania, for the full context. From 375 AD to 586 AD, climate change, the Huns, famine, and overpopulation led to what is known as the Migration Period. We will now explore the main seven Germanic migrations as chronologically as possible, starting with the Goths. The Goths could have come from southern Scandinavia and lived around the lower Vistula River. They were the sons of Gothus and were formerly known as the Gutans. The meaning of the word Goth has been generally accepted to translate into too poor. Experts speculate that they could have gotten their name from a flood that forced them to migrate south from Scandinavia. Other possible translations are men, seed spreaders, stallions, or born and bred in the north. The Goths had a unique start to their culture a more equal family lineage type called bilingual, where both genders inherited equally. Families would marry each other and give gifts. Over time, these gifts came in the way of alliances. This allowed for the Goths to unite in a way that other Germanic tribes struggled to do, turning them into a powerhouse. The Goths would raid into Rome. The first recorded was in 238 AD, with Rome bribing them to leave them alone. However, this only encouraged more raiding once the treaties were expired. The Goths would also use the Black Sea to raid many ports along the empire, causing much chaos. Rome at this point was undergoing internal struggles, and many Germanic tribes used this to take advantage. The Romans were impressed by the Goths, and over time subjugated many Gothic kings. But this only built up their prestige and allowed them to thrive from Roman funding and military tactics. Rome did this to defend their border. The Romans basically funded the Goths to act as their border security. But by 320 AD, the Goths had grown into an enormous power that even the Romans feared, and they were right on their border. The Romans therefore enacted preemptive strikes, ending Goth relationships with Rome and weakening them. However, there was a new rising power, the Huns, who had defeated some Gothic kings by 370 AD. A race of men Heathrow unknown had now arisen from a hidden nook of the earth, like a tempest of snows from the high mountains, and was seizing or destroying everything in its way. This would lead to a major split in Gothic culture. The Eastern Goths, who became Hun subjects and absorbed some Hun culture, became the Ostrogoths, while the Goths and some other Germanic tribes who chose to flee to the west became the Visigoths. Around 90,000 Goth refugees asked Rome if they could join their empire, and Rome would accept, offering them land to settle as their subjects. But the Romans took advantage of these Goths and didn't treat them equally. The Goths, for example, were forced to sell their children for rotten dog meat or starve. This caused unrest and rebellion, forcing many battles and skirmishes, with the Goths coming out on top, but they were pushed back to their border by the Black Sea. As the Goths raided, their army swelled with numbers from freed slaves, prisoners, and Roman traitors. The Eastern Roman Emperor, Valens, sent for help from the West. The forces would meet up around Adrianople, an important city to supply for their route to Constantinople. Emperor Valens would also bring with him the Roman armies defending the Persian border to the east. However, due to other Germanic tribes raiding in the west, the western armies would be delayed. Emperor Valens of the Eastern Empire was leading the force himself, and decided to attack the Goths without waiting for his western counterpart. This was incredibly risky, as the Goths had outmaneuvered the Romans and held the outskirts of Adrianople. Along with Germanic slaves and some other Germanic warriors who joined them, the Goths had formed a mighty army of around 12 to 15,000 while the Roman army was around 15 to 30,000 strong. The two sides stood negotiating. The Goths prolonged the battle to wait for more of their allies to arrive, and Rome was wary to attack due to the Goths' superior position atop a hill. 
during these negotiations. The Roman army was exposed to sunlight of around 40 degrees in their armour. These negotiations were cut short due to Roman cavalry positioning a bit too near to the Goths, causing the Goths to charge and attack them. The Roman cavalry retreated at once. The Roman historian Arminius stated their retreat was as cowardly as their advance was rash. At this moment the Goth allies had arrived, possibly hiding out of sight and mistaking this for the start of the battle. These allies were 10,000 cavalry consisting of Goths and Eastern Normandic Alans, also known as Huns. A third of the Roman cavalry marched at the Goth cavalry to attempt to save the fleeing, but were too late, and were now stuck in a skirmish. Seeing this sudden advantage, the Goths marched down from the hill at the Roman army, that was still not fully in formation. They simply charged down the hill in a stereotypical barbarian horde. The Roman cavalry were doing a good job, pushing the Germanic cavalry back to their supplies. However, due to an unknown reason, many started to flee, possibly just losing control of their horses who were getting scared. This caused the remaining Romans to be slaughtered by the German cavalry, who came out on top. This allowed for the German cavalry to be able to charge into the Roman left flank. Many of this cavalry were also javelin throwers and were able to get in a good position behind their German allies. Many of the Romans fled, leaving only the most experienced still fighting. Either an Emperor Valens bodyguards fled, forcing him to seek safety in the middle of the battle. This led the Emperor and the top Roman warriors fighting on their own. Emperor Valens ordered his right flank to charge in and help, but they instead fled along with the top Roman generals. Emperor Valens was either struck by a javelin here and died with the rest of the Roman forces, or was carried away to safety, only for the Germans to burn down his encampment later on, killing him. Two thirds of the Eastern Roman army had now been destroyed, and it's unknown how many of the Germans were lost. Many cite the Battle of Adrianople to be the start of the fall of Rome. Either way, it would weaken the empire significantly. Rome would never fully recover, and this defeat led to the Germanic tribes sweeping across Western Europe, shaping it significantly. Rome was unwilling and, some say, unable to deal with this threat, so allowed for the Goths to settle and become self-governing west of the Black Sea in what is now called the Balkans. At this point in time, the Empire was also struggling for manpower, and therefore relied much more on tribal forces, with many of the Germanic peoples rising in the ranks of the Roman Empire many of them becoming great generals. The Goths in particular seemed to thrive in the empire and rose to some of the highest ranks. Although they were still taken advantage of and used by the Romans, a good example of this is the Battle of Frigidus in 394 AD, where the Gothic infantry were used as cannon fodder and recklessly, with many of them dying needlessly. The Catholic Church would also rise to power during this time with Germanic and Roman pagans facing persecution if they didn't convert. Alric, a Visigoth general in the Roman army, grew angry at this, and led another rebellion. He proved himself to be a pain in the backside for Rome and the Catholic Church, raiding and pillaging across Greece, and winning a few skirmishes in Italy. In 407, Alric started raiding Italy once more, but this time was paid off. However, the Roman autocracy were upset for having to foot the bill of this bribe and plotted to arrest and execute the Roman commander who agreed to it. However, this Roman commander himself was a German, and after his execution, many German warriors who were now stationed around Italy to protect it joined Auric. Auric pressed his advantage and marched towards Rome, his numbers growing as he marched from Roman German warriors and German slaves joining him. Auric sieged Rome in 408 and 409, and after negotiations broke down, he sacked the city. This was the first time Rome had been sacked since 390 BC. Rome was robbed and looted, and in 410 AD, Auric died from disease. Next we'll be discussing the Vandal migration, most likely the sons of all Vandal. Their name can be translated to turned, twisted, wind, or sometimes water. The Mediterranean Sea was known by the Germanic tribes as the Wendel Sea, meaning Vandal Sea. The Vandals originally inhabited what we call today as Poland, and they started migrating around 410 AD. 
The Vandals had a hostile history with the Romans, and were not as unified as other Germanic tribes, such as the Goths. Because of this, the Vandals were often displaced, mostly by other Germanic tribes, with many of the Vandals migrating and finding refuge in Roman Pannonia. With Hun invasion, however, Roman Pannonia was no longer safe, and with the huge increase of refugees, the Vandals decided to move further west. After some failed attempts at taking some other Roman land, the Vandals ended up raiding Gaul, in what we call today Northern France. They gained an unfavourable reputation here for the amount of destruction and death they caused on their travels, and gave all Germanic barbarians a bad name. They raided their way through Gaul and ended up in Hispania, where Roman commanders here recruited them as mercenary armies. The Vandals grew unruly, however, and were described as wild beasts rampaging across Hispania. This, along with famine and pestilence, soon caused Hispanian population to diminish. As before Vandal raiding, Hispania was quite safe and an ignored part of the empire. This wasn't helped by Rome being preoccupied with civil wars and not sending aid to this most western province. As stated before, the Vandals decided to settle down in 410 AD. Once the Romans were no longer dealing with civil war, and now a threat again, they created three kingdoms in Hispania, splitting up from other Germanic tribes who had accompanied them. The first of these three kingdoms were the Alani, who were actually a nomadic Iranian tribe that travelled with the Huns. The next were the Swabi, a notable Germanic tribe, and of course the most populous Vandals, who settled two different areas. The Visigoths would later join them, taking the rest of Hispania, and with Roman funding, ran off the other Germanic kingdoms. We'll be exploring this later. The Vandals were expelled from Roman land, so the king of the Vandals, Gesseric, took North Africa, pillaging towns along the way. The Romans sent armies to dispatch the Vandals in 432 AD, but were defeated. The Romans now struggled to deal with this Vandal threat, as they were skilled sailors, and could defend their coastal cities in Northern Africa by getting supplies from their navy. Gesseric decided to settle in North Africa, off the coast of Italy, and built a large pirate fleet. Here, the rich Mediterranean Sea became their new raiding target, particularly the islands now known as Sardinia and Sicily. By 439, Carthage, Rome's most important settlement in Africa, was sacked by Gesseric. The Vandals followed an Aryan denomination of Christianity, and therefore the Nicene Christians were persecuted by the Vandals, who put the city to the sword. By taking Carthage, the Vandals also now had their hands on the Roman fleet, which was stationed there, adding to their already large pirate fleet, and this could have possibly made them the most powerful seafaring nation in the Mediterranean. Here, the Vandals also recruited many North Africans and possibly Middle Eastern people to join their ranks. This emboldened the Vandals, who raided and pillaged their way across the whole Mediterranean. The towns were completely sacked, and many attacks all happened at the same time, so fast that the Roman armies could not reinforce them all. The Roman armies gathered, both east and west, but could no longer safely pass into Africa, so the Vandals and Gesseric were safe. As the Romans travelled south to deal with the Vandals, the Huns took advantage and raided in the north, and vice versa. The Romans were the majority population in North Africa at the time, however they simply paid their taxes to the minority Germanic ruling class. Gesseric waited for Rome to weaken before attacking again in 455 AD, after the death of the Roman Emperor, and sailed straight for Rome itself. In pure fear of the Vandal reputation, many of the ruling class in Rome fled, leaving only the church to negotiate. Following this negotiation, Rome, the most powerful and wealthy city in the world, willingly opened its gates to the Vandals, who proceeded to sack Rome for 14 days. Temples were stripped, wealth was looted, and the palaces were picked clean. However, limited destruction and killing took place, with Gesseric honouring his word. After which, the Vandals sailed away with all the loot and captives they could store on their boats. The Vandals would take full control of the Balearic Islands, Corsica, Sardinia, Malta, and the ports of Sicily around a year later. 
Gesserich died in 477 AD. He reigned for longer than most rulers of the time, and much longer than any barbarian ruler at the time. However, without his leadership, the Vandal Kingdom went into decline, which soon led to a reconquest by Rome. It's from the Vandal tribe that the origin of the English word Vandal stems from. Although originally meaning wanderer, by the 1600s it began to mean destroyer of what is beautiful. The Visigoths were called the Visigoths instead of just Goths from 507 AD, after the Ostrogoths became a new phrase to call the Goths who remained in the east. Therefore, the Visigoths were the Goths of the western country. Some other names for these western Goths were the Turingi, the Wessi, the Vesi, or the Visi. So they simply combined these with Goths, therefore becoming the Visigoths. Tavingi translates to forest people or tree, while Wessi translates into good, better, or worthy people. These Visigoths would end up travelling further west, intersettling the Iberia, and creating a new Visigothic kingdom as the Roman Empire fell. The Swabi and the Vandals would also migrate to Iberia, but the Visigoths were by far the most successful, and would in time create the Visigothic kingdom, which would conquer the whole of the Iberian Peninsula. The founding of this new Visigothic kingdom and its expansion to the west was unhindered by Rome. After Alaric's sacking of Rome, which we already went over in the end of the Gothic section, the legacy of the Visigothic kingdom can still be seen today in Iberia through genetics and place names, although they only made up one third of the population and made up the ruling class. Because the ruling Visigoths were such a minority, the conquered would import their culture onto the Visigoths who would in time become nearly fully Romanized. It's because of this reason that many antiquarians and historians simply see the Visigothic Kingdom as part of the Roman Empire. The Visigothic Kingdom, however, would suffer from much internal disputes and many civil wars that would only be made worse by Muslim invasions from Africa. They would attempt to settle this constant devastation by converting to Catholic in 586 AD. However, the Visigoths still had the five following massive problems. First of all, their monarchy wasn't hereditary, leading to many civil wars. Next, they had constant raids from Vandal pirates in the Mediterranean. On top of this, there were many attempted Muslim invasions into the Iberia. Furthermore, there were many resentful nobles and peasants because of cultural differences. And finally, although now Catholic, the Catholic Church would also interfere in domestic politics and itself be quite corrupt. These five reasons led to the Visigothic Kingdom being completely destroyed and overrun by Muslim invasions by 710 AD. The destruction of this kingdom would sow the seeds for the later Crusades. The last bastion of Celtic culture of the time was Britannia, who, with the help of Germanic mercenaries, managed to lose the interest of Rome, who withdrew. These same Germanic mercenaries also helped the Romanised Britons against the still Celtic Picts in the north, who were constantly raiding. However, upon seeing this green and pleasant land, the Germanic mercenaries decided not to just take their money and leave, but to take the place of the Romans. The Germans called this land Albany, an Anglicanised version of the word Albion, most likely in reference to the White Cliffs of Dover. Great Britain is still sometimes referred to as Albion or Albany to this date. Many of the native Britons had grown used to Roman life, but with the withdrawal of the empire, this life became much harder to obtain. Imagine now, if the electricity was cut off, you had no heating and you needed to learn to hunt again. Many of the Britons were struggling to adapt to pre-empire life. Much of the towns and temples built by the Romans were now abandoned or became refuge for the homeless. And from the decay of Roman civilization, older Celtic traditions saw a revival. The rural areas of Albion were not as Romanised, with Britain Hill Fort standing even during Roman rule, and now they had outlasted it. They gained many refugees from the now unfunctionable Roman settlements. The adaption to pre-empire life would have been harder for those living in South Albany, as this is where Roman rule was most potent, although Roman life may still have flourished in smaller communities. Celtic and British gods also saw a revival, and were worshipped alongside the Latin gods. Although Christianity was still dominant with the added mix of sun druidry rituals, 
Albany was now broken up again into many Britain tribes, allowing for the Germanic tribes to invade on a more equal footing. The Germanic tribes in Scandinavia were marine time societies, with much of their survival and exploration depending on the sea, rivers and access to clean water. This dried them into building boats, the most sophisticated in the world for the time, and were therefore able to reach Albion with relative ease. The still pagan Picts and Scots also caused much chaos, raiding and pillaging of what once was protected by Rome. The Germanic mercenaries and now invaders were called the Anglo-Saxons. An amalgamation of Germanic tribes from the North German coastline and possibly into Scandinavia. They consisted mostly of the Jutes, Angles and Saxons. They are the sons of Angle and Saxonate. They wouldn't have called themselves the Anglo-Saxons at the time of invasion, although it was used shortly after and was possibly invented by King Alfred the Great, who called himself King of the Anglo-Saxons, and therefore it could be considered a contemporary term. The Anglo-Saxons spoke a North Germanic language and followed Germanic paganism that was more similar to the Scandinavian tribes. As their religion was influenced even further by the Celts in Albany, we now refer to it as Anglo-Saxon Paganism. They were known to be a tactful warrior and seafaring people. They once gained their wealth from mercenary work and sea raiding, but were now entranced by the Albion opportunity. The first Anglo-Saxon kingdom was Kent, after they betrayed and overthrew their Britain employers and took the land for themselves. After this success, and hearing of the fertile and strategic land in Albion, more and more Germans decided to invade. Many of the Britons were displaced and fled mostly into what we call today Cornwall, Wales and into Scotland. While others simply accepted the Anglo-Saxons as their new overlords taking over from the Romans. It's at this point where some of the displaced Britons decided to flee their homeland to the continent, settling in what we call today Brittany, named after the Britons. It's the Anglo-Saxon conquest of Albion that highly influenced the tales of King Arthur. I'll be exploring the full Arthurian legends in a later video. The Anglo-Saxons would settle many kingdoms, referred now to as the land of the Angles. This over time changed to Angland, and even further over time into England. It is the first Germanic Anglo-Saxons who were the first generation of Englishmen in the British Isles, and who the English people can track their heritage from. But the Anglo-Saxons didn't wipe out the Britons or Celtic culture fully. Instead, the two people and cultures would merge together over time, creating a new culture and race. The Anglo-Saxons would dominate what we now call England and still rule to this day. The Germanic tribes in Scandinavia, however, would not stop coming, thereafter becoming known as the Vikings, who we'll be exploring in a later video. These pie charts represent the average person living in different parts of the British Isles. Although the Germanic tribes only conquered into the south of Great Britain, all of the British Isles now have Germanic DNA, including Ireland, Wales and Scotland. In fact, Scotland has even more Norwegian DNA than England, most likely stemming from the later Viking invasions. However, as you'd expect, England itself has far more Anglo-Saxon DNA with the average person having at least 10 to 40%. The green DNA is indigenous or native Britain DNA. This is very diverse and the people themselves had little in common with each other. So little that there's in fact no such thing as common Britain or Celtic DNA. So the green is basically just an indigenous hodgemodge. According to this study, which is only an estimate, Ireland has the most indigenous DNA with 48%, while England has the least, with 20%. The gold is what remains of the Anglo-Saxon migration, mainly consisting of the Angles, Saxons and Jutes. This study suggests that England has the most Anglo-Saxon DNA, with 48%, while Ireland has the least, with 24%. The brown represents other Germanic DNA that isn't Anglo-Saxon, such as the Norman. Again, England has the most, with 20%, while Ireland has the least, with 12%. It's interesting to think that the average Englishman is equal parts Central Germanic and Indigenous Britain. The blue represents the later Scandinavian German DNA, which is most likely the Vikings. England has the most Viking heritage, but with only 9%, while Ireland has the least, with 6%. The red DNA is Iberian, 
and all of Britain has around 2 to 3 percent. And pink is everything else and this is most likely most influenced by modern mass immigration from the 1960s. This consists mostly of Eastern European, Middle Eastern and South Asian. As a whole, there's only very minor differences throughout the British Isles and shows that we have basically just become an Anglo-Saxon and Britain melting pot. I'll be doing a video on the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms and the Heptarchy in a later video. The Ostrogoths are associated with the Gurumfi and the Turumfki tribes who lived further in the east. Ostro warped from the word Uster, meaning eastern, so their name literally means the Eastern Goths. They were the subjects of the Huns until the death of Attila in 453 AD. Now led by Theodoric the Great, they will gain a great opportunity after the Byzantine Empire or Eastern Roman Empire funded his invasion into the Kingdom of Italy. The Kingdom of Italy at this point was already under the control of a Germanic barbarian who opposed the child emperor Romulus Augustulus and became the King of Italy. His name was Odyssea. Odysseus overthrowing of the Emperor is traditionally seen as the marking of the end of the Western Roman Empire. Odysseus originally ruled Italy as a client of the Emperor of the Byzantine Empire, Zeno. Odysseus, however, failed to remain loyal to the Byzantine Empire, which is why Theodoric the Great was backed to replace him, pitting German against German, to rule Italy under the Byzantine Empire. Theodoric the Great would usurp the Kingdom of Italy and created a new Ostrogothic Kingdom. He also proclaimed himself King of the Goths and Romans, showing that not only did he want to unite these two people, but also showed that he had greater ambitions than just being a client state under the Byzantine Empire. This quite rightly pissed off the Byzantine Empire, who would later conquer and destroy the Ostrogothic Kingdom around 60 years later. The Franks once inhabited the land we call Calais and Belgium, before expanding eastward into the Roman Empire as it fell in 477 AD. There were many subgroups of the Franci tribes, however they merged together over time. The naming would have come from the adjective Frank, meaning free, or from the Old English or Norse words Francia and Fracia, meaning fierce, bold or insolent. They were known for being skilled with what we now call the Francisca Axe, a throwing axe that would have been used for hundreds of years. Although other Germanic tribes also used this style of axe, the Franci were renowned for their skill with it. Clovis I expanded Frank territory from the years 481 to 508, and the Franks inhabited most of what we now call France. He subjugated many other peoples in his territory and made Paris the new capital. Clovis I is considered many to be the founder of France and cleared the road for Charlemagne. He also converted to Christianity, leading the way for the rest of the Franks. However, due to Germanic inheritance laws, the Frankish kingdom was still very vulnerable and disunited, as all the male children would inherit the kingdom equally, splitting it up many times, normally into around four kingdoms. The Franks were also big into polygamy, the tradition of having many wives, and this only added to the problem. This changed in 613 AD with Clothar II, who managed to unite the Franks under one kingdom called Austrasia, or Merovingian kingdom through winning civil wars and a bit of luck. He was also a monogamist, having only one wife, which was quite unusual for the Franks. Under Clothar II, all of what we now know as France was united, and it even expanded a little further to the east. However, Brittany was still settled by the Britons. However, this did not last, with the Franks also getting split and the kingdoms infighting. Although when the Franks were united, they were the great power in Europe, only second to the Byzantine Empire. The Franks were also constantly engaged with skirmishes with a Muslim-controlled Iberia known as Umayyad. However, they came out on top more often and stopped the Muslims expanding further into Europe. If not for the Franks, Western Europe would have become much more Islamic and even Italy would have been threatened. The Franks would over time centralise once they adopted a more Roman-like inheritance system with only the firstborn male inheriting, with the later Charlemagne being able to truly capitalise on the Frankish power. The Franks would dominate what we now call France and still rule to this day. 
They were also responsible for the later cultural creation of Western Europe and its dominance. Modern DNA sampling shows that the French is actually 20 to 30% Germanic, and they are still quite a racially homogenous peoples. However, the French people are more racially diverse than one would think, including Celtic, Romance, Iberian, Mediterranean, and even North African DNA. And finally, we'll be exploring the Lombards. They called themselves the Willini, meaning wolves, after a major victory against the Vandals. However, they're better known as the Lombards, which stems from them having long beards. They were a much harder Germanic tribe to identify, and they may have just adopted the name of a former Germanic tribe. However, we do know from the historian Jordanis that they claim to have migrated from Scandinavia. However, this particular historian is known for being quite lax about the facts. We can also infer that they kept to themselves much more than the other Germanic tribes. By the 6th century, the Lombards were more powerful tribes in the Balkans and were manipulated by the Romans to attack other Germanic tribes, but this was normal. The Lombards were normally used as a counterweight to the other Germanic tribes, known as the Gelpids. And once the Gelpids were later wiped out, the Lombards grew even more in power. The king of the Lombards, Alboin, took advantage of the disrest in Rome in 568 and invaded Italy itself. The Italians themselves were disunited as they were not too fond of being ruled by the Byzantines. And within a year, the Lombards had taken all of northern Italy. Alboin was later killed in a plot by the Byzantines, but by then the Lombards were too entrenched and powerful within Italy. They also occupied or had subjects in the south of Italy, however this was unstable and often changed hands. They had already adopted Christianity, although this was Arianism, and therefore they were swept away with constant religious revolts similar to other Germanic tribes. Their religion is also why some people call this period of Italy the Arian Kingdom. The main oversimplified difference between Arianism and Catholicism is that Arianism creed that the Holy Trinity are not one, but that the Father created the Son. Or even simpler, Jesus is not equal to God. This might seem trivial to us today, but back then these minor religious differences caused thousands of deaths. The Lombards main threat with the Franks to their west, but also did face skirmishes and needed to reinforce borders with the Slavic tribes to the east and the Italians to the south. The Greeks and the Byzantines were also an overhanging threat, as they also contested Italy. The Lombards also started the tradition of giving the Pope land in Italy to rule, which would in time evolve into the Paper States and create a bigger divide between West Rome and the Byzantine Empire. This gave the Pope a huge amount of power, being able to side with either the Lombards or the Byzantine as suited. By 757, the Franks had managed to conquer the Lombards and the Papal States would form officially with land given to them by the Franks. This weakened the Lombards and gave even more power to the Catholic Church. The Lombards held the mountains to protect their borders and this was a great strategic position. They were also getting fed up with the Pope's political games, so created their own anti-Pope. This in turn led to the Pope convincing Charlemagne, King of the Franks, to fully invade Italy. By 775, the Lombards had fully fallen to Charlemagne, who proclaimed himself King of the Lombards. The fall of the Lombards and the rise of the Papal States also led to the death of Arianism. Catholicism would now spread uncontested and be the dominant Christian denomination. The Germanic migrations would defeat the Roman Empire and created the Western Europe that we still have today. But what of the rest of the Germanic tribes that didn't migrate to new lands? What of Germany? Well, those left in Scandinavia would for the most part look inward and be culturally dominated by the rest of Europe. But they were able to hold on to their own heritage due to being separated by the Baltic Sea, but would only act as a minor power apart from a short-lived Swedish Empire in the 18th century. They would also see some early influence from Viking raids until themselves being dominated by Christianity. The Germanic tribes not in Scandinavia would be dominated by the Franks and the Catholic Church. By the 9th century, the Franks had expanded their lands into the east, into what we would now call Germany. 
The papal states had now also changed the meaning of the title emperor. Whereas before it was a mutual title of the holder of the Roman Empire and the Pope simply giving the Emperor their blessing. Now the title of Emperor was viewed as an honour from the Pope and the Pope would give this title to whoever best suited them. How was the Papal States able to get away with this and why had their influence grown so much? Well mostly due to the constant threat of Islam that had been constantly trying to invade Europe for centuries and were now skirmishing with the Franks in the West and the Greeks to the east. This gave the Europeans a sense of unity around Christianity and in turn the Pope more influence over kings. At this point in time the Pope was basically an unofficial president of Christendom. This also complicated Byzantium as the Empress of the time was Empress Irene but the Papal States being patriarchal did not grant her this honour splitting the Byzantium Empire even further from Western Europe. Charlemagne, King of the Franks, was instead granted the honour of new Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. But the Papal States, not wanting to diminish their influence, refused to help reform the Frankish inheritance laws and simply took back the title once the Emperor had died. When Charlemagne died, this split the Frankish Kingdom up into three, and the Pope used this title as a way of controlling and influencing Western Europe. East and West Francia would grow apart over time, forming what we now know as Germany in the 10th century. Deutschland translates to Germanic lands, from the old Roman Germania. Germany then decided to reform the impractical inheritance laws into an elective monarchy, with the electoral votes being held by the most powerful dukes in Germany. Otto the Great, the East Frankish ruler however, chose to ignore this electoral system and instead chose to crown his son and heir apparent. This led to civil war, and even East Francia got involved, but Otto the Great came out on top. Later on, Otto the Great set his sights on the wealthy lands of Italy, but instead of attacking, he put a puppet on the throne. The Papal States helped to do this, and Otto the Great and the Pope put Berengar II on the throne of Italy. This political manoeuvring, however, didn't quite pay off, with Berengar II revolting against Otto the Great and the Papal States, going as far as to besiege Rome itself. Otto rushed down to defend the Pope and forced Berengar to retreat. Here, Otto met with the Pope and swore an oath to defend the Catholic Church against all her enemies. The Pope was pleased to say the least and granted Otto the honour of becoming Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. However, the Papal States began to plot against Otto as soon as he left Rome, causing political battles behind the scenes between the Emperor, Otto, and the Pope. Otto again came out on top, causing the Pope to be ousted and getting the new Pope to crown his son as co-Emperor. This also created the first official German dynasty, the Etonian dynasty. This complicated the relationship with the Catholic Church and caused more political plots. And over time, the Dukes of Germany managed to reclaim their right to become electors and to elect their new king. This in effect destroyed the Ottonian dynasty in 1024. The Holy Roman Empire would fracture into tiny pieces, becoming consumed and weakened by politics and political manoeuvre. The amount of Dukes with elector status would increase to ridiculous amounts, with many cities becoming semi-independent. Many bitter arguments would divide Germany against itself, as each elector bid for power, and the other powers of Europe and the Pope took advantage of them as needed. The Holy Roman Empire was basically a bunch of states with an overreaching, loose set of laws. However, this disunity was also a sort of strength, as it also allowed the Holy Roman Empire to survive centuries of civil wars, external disputes and changing times. But it was never a reliable great power and would at many times just become the chessboard of Europe. One of the electors, Prussia, would finally unify Germany in the 19th century through conquest, shifting the balance of power in Europe forever, with them being a great power in World War I, II and in the modern day. It even had an extremely short-lived empire. And Germany, or Deutschland, is now the leading economic power in Europe. Although the Germanic people can be tied together with genetics, unlike the Celts, it's still important to understand that they did not recognise themselves as a unified people. It was instead the Romans who really coined the idea of Germania. 
but in the 1900s, with a more racial view of the world, pushed some German academics to want a unified Germanic nation. And later, Otto von Bismarck, a Germanic prince, was able to set the foundations to lead towards this. Scholars did not clearly differentiate between the Germanic peoples, Celtic peoples and the Scythian peoples until the late 18th century with the discovery of the Indo-Europeans. And before this time, German scholars considered the Celtic peoples to be part of the Germanic group. Tatticus's writings was often used to push the idea of unity between the Germanic people. They picked out the good, such as them being warriors, having strong marriage ties, being less prone to vice than the Romans, and of course the idea of them being unsullied people and not intermixing. They also used this past to push for a liberal democratic form of government and a unified Germanic state. While Scandinavia placed more weight on the Viking Age, and the fact that the Germanic tribes first migrated from Scandinavia, resulting in a movement where they saw themselves as the womb of nations to aid their imperial ambitions. Prussia and the other Germanic states would also jump on this bandwagon a couple years later. Although the most obvious example of this is the rise of the Nazi party and the notion of a superior German race and purity, there were other regimes that used similar propaganda such as the Swedish Empire, Prussia as a nation and the rise of Otto von Bismarck's political ambitions. Romanticised Celtic nationalism may seem harmless and a bit of a joke, as although it did brew hate and civil unrest, such as with the IRA, it was nothing compared to what the rise of romanticised German nationalism did. This is most likely because the German nations were much more capable than the Celtic ones. A common example of Germanic romanticism is the idea of the Aryan race. But this term was not even liked by the Nazis, as Aryan was basically just the original way to refer to the Indo-European language group. For the Nazis, the word Aryan was way too inclusive. But we can blame this misunderstanding on modern movies and pop culture. The German academics also didn't like the term, as it referred more to linguistics and not to race. Some German propaganda did use the term, however Nordic race and Germanic peoples was more common. So why do neo-Nazis, otherwise known as modern-day Nazis, like the term Aryan race more than the original Nazis do? Well, I'm not sure, but maybe it's because it's more inclusive to all white people instead of just Germans. And not all white supremacists are German. So why are neo-Nazis so heavily pushed back on today, while Celtic Romanticism and nationalism in general, especially in minority groups, are still allowed to flourish with very little pushback? Well, again, I'm not sure. But I often find that you can tell what cultures and nations are most powerful as them expressing any form of nationalism themselves is feared and berated. However, nationalism has both positive and negative impacts. I find you can spot positive nationalism simply by not being sprung up on hatred and division, but instead of promoting unity and tradition. But it seems because of Germany's Nazi past, they struggle to grapple with this. Although well-meaning, overly authoritarian measures are put in place today in Germany to prevent nationalism, halting back the positive unifying aspects and dividing people against the state. It's not only Germany that has this trouble, but I think Germany is where it can be most easily seen. The most obvious example is the European migration debate, where there isn't really a debate, but one side of the argument just gets shut down. This will again only cause more animosity even though there are both positive and negative aspects to migration. Germany today has become much more diverse than ever before. Europe as a whole needs to move. Member states must share the responsibility of asylum-seeking refugees. We have already accomplished a lot and we will continue to succeed. I feel proud and thankful in seeing how countless numbers of people in Germany have reacted to the arrival of refugees. The constant level of genetic mixing means that the Germanic people are now thoroughly diverse. In 2015 alone, Germany decided to import more than one million refugees, a kind of Germanic migration in the opposite way. And I thought a fitting end to this video. And I hope you enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed researching it. All of the references are in the description. If you go to the about page on my YouTube channel, you can see what video I'm planning to do next.